Um, and at the, some of the, I think one of the main points in the book is that the quality of education, the kind of education that we provide today might not be lending itself to the kind of modernity um, that would uh, be able to bridge across um, the kind of challenges that we're talking about, that, that you just mentioned in society. What, what kind of uh, education would you propose? Um, can I read out something about sure. Oriya? There's a fair amount of uh, uh, my thoughts on education that's sprinkled across the book. So um, to your question, the kind of education. Um, I refer here to the kind of education that opens up the mind with questions rather than closes it with answers learned by rote. The education that teaches us to respect each other as human beings and not pull one another down even when scrambling for the same resources. The education that persuades us to stand with our head held high despite all our perceived flaws and not idolize a stereotype. The education that asks us to think for ourselves and speak our opinion, not pander to those of others. Interesting. Um, how do you compare the educational system here with what you've experienced abroad? And have you ever come across a truly free and open society in your travels? That's, that's a very tough question. <laughs> um, I'm very involved in um, the education system in India, just trying to do my bit wherever I can uh, at different levels. Um, especially, um, you know, it's easier in India to contribute to the university, the higher education system, because since um, independence, the focus has always been in higher education, because the leaders, uh, the political leaders came from the elites, for whom the primary education was already, was a given. So, so there's a lot happening in the higher education phase. I'm more concerned, and I find it harder to work and improve the primary education system in India. Um, in fact, there are uh, 12 million kids who are out of school, who are street kids, 12 million children in India who live on the streets. So they go and go to schools and they're just out of the whole system. They're off the map of democracy, so nobody even cares about them. So that's the segment which I feel very strongly about. And if you ask me to compare that segment to most of the countries that I've lived in, which is in Europe and US, it's heartbreaking. Um, we're talking about you know digital divides and things like that across you know um, geographies. You talk here. I think we need to we need to first look at the basic education divide that we are causing. Um, the problem with democracy is that um, those pockets of population of of people. Um, who don't vote or who are not important to political leaders, people are, the system, the democratic system, finds less incentive or it's just not part of the system to actually improve their worth. Um, so tribals is another example. Um, and again, education of people who belong to uh, the, the Adivasi communities, it's, you know, it's very difficult because in my work with them, I feel that uh, they don't necessarily need to be brought into the kind of education system that uh, we have currently or that we wish for either. They have their own system going and how do we actually encourage them to develop on their own? Um, so that's you know the first part of your question of just comparing because I would be comparing this, the primary, and it's, very, it's, it's really ghastly, the comparison. Have I ever come across an ideal system Society, um, no, and I wonder if there is an ideal society. I think, you know, uh, there is no ideal society. Um, I think each one of us feels most comfortable in certain contexts, and uh, that I that that comfort of an individual vis-a-vis -vis the setting one is in would come closest to what we would call ideal. Okay, and. Do you have any hope that in India in the future it will sort of we will break all the the boundaries and resurrect ourselves into a very positive free 
truly democratic society. Uh, given that our new generation is very, very much more advanced and savvy, do you have hope? Yeah, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Um, but to reach there, of course, we've got to make, um, you know, we've got to take huge strides. Um, the you know, the curb on freedom and expression that we're seeing today, um, it's a misnomer that uh, it's only today that it's, you know, that it's heightened. Since independence or, you know, the, since a very long time, uh, the freedom to express ourselves, which is the basic step towards progress, right, to be able to uh, take that leap that we're talking about, that's always been quite difficult in India. And I think that, uh, if you are able to crack that, then there will be a lot of ideas that will come up, that will be free to be exposed and can be taken forward then. Un action can only happen after a great idea is put forth. But if you are not able to put forth that for various reasons um, and systemic reasons, which is irrespective of the political party that is in place, it is going to be difficult to get on to action. And uh, what do you think forms the basis of our values today? Money, I know, is number one. Having male children is the woman's purpose in life for many people. Producing successful IIT level children becomes very important so parents can brag about their success. Uh, you also speak about how difficult it is to accumulate honest, hard-earned wealth given the nexus of nepotism, corruption and extortion. Will we ever get out of this vicious cycle and hone in on true, solid, ethical values? Mm. Yeah, I have a full ch chapter on... Um, <laughs> I sound <laughs> so I sound very negative. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, there's, again, you know, on values, there's nothing negative and, and, and positive. It can be... Um, uh, there, you know, so, yeah, so there is a full essay on values and I've put my thoughts out there. Um, I think um, if you look at the, the basis of various aspects um, of our lives that uh, we call values, our beliefs, or well, you know, various aspects of our lives that are driven by our values, um, a lot of it has to do with our own individual perception and understanding of equality. Um, so, uh, so, give me the examples that you mentioned, um, you know, the, a, a son going to IIT, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, every parent wishes the best for their child, right? So, um, you would want your child to have what you didn't. didn't. And when you didn't, that means that within the society there is a um, you know, there's some kind of an inequality or a, uh, you perceive that there is an inequality, something that somebody else had and you didn't. And therefore comes the pressure, pressure if you may, on your child to achieve something that you feel would be the pathway to get what you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so most such examples, and you can pick others, it ultimately boils down to your understanding of equality um, or the lack of uh, of you versus the context that you're in. And how about the the whole the nexus of cor nepotism, corruption, and and extortion, which has infiltrated and corrupted the entire society? I mean, you can't you can't do something without paying a bribe. I mean, yes. You know, that's, I think corruption is really in the system that we have. And, uh, Can we this, ever get rid of it? Yeah, and the, you know, so again, it again, bo again, it boils down to inequality, right? Because if you have in front of you have people who've, um, you know, you have far more resources than you have, then you're obviously tempted, then and that's what's happening. The informal economy is huge as well. So again, I'm hopeful uh, that we would get rid of it, but it's a difficult way to, you know. Uh, Do you see any improvement with the... Uh with the changes of government? Um, I've spent quite a lot of time in the corporate, uh, Indian corporate uh, world, which is very interesting um, because um, um, on one hand, um, it's still very family driven. Most of the big corporations are very family uh, driven. 
Um, so the power equation of uh, people who are taking the decisions and the people who have the uh, power to get things done and the contacts to get things done lie in the hand of few. Um, and on the other hand, the government, um, while there is quite a lot of emphasis on the economy, uh, there are fewer, more practical ways in which corporations or startups, big and small, can actually flourish. So if you look at the combination you know, of, the, of the two, um, when there is when corporations when when there is you know when it makes it when it's more challenging to thrive as a business and when the spokesperson on the other side on the side of business is someone who has power and contacts it leads to nepotism and corruption so there are, so so there has to be a change on both sides on the way companies function in india it has to be we have to move to from a, a more flatter structure. And on the other side, I think governments need to be walking the talk and need to make policies which are uh, more practical. And uh, I've written about this in the book as well. We are obsessed by GDP uh, and you know the numbers and the to the last decimal point. I mean, you have to look at how does that translate into actionable items and what's the result of you know, the numbers that we are obsessed with. Mm -hmm. um, there was one part of your book which really fascinated me. It was your experience at Mother Teresa's home in Calcutta. Uh, having met her personally, I was surprised to read of your experiences with the local populace in Calcutta towards the poor and deprived. Do share it with the audience. And, uh, and then you draw the conclusion about the lack of love in our society for our fellow man who has less. Um, how marriages are determined by caste, color, creed, and money, not love. I, I find that a very fascinating aspect. Yeah, um, actually, Chirag and me, we both of us, we were in Calcutta, it's my husband. Um, oh, and, uh, you know, we uh, you're spending some time um, in Mother Teresa's um, shelter, her home. Um, and uh, and right next to that, and, and how many of you have been there? Yeah. Um, so it's quite um, fascinating because it's in an area which is right next to a temple. And on one hand, the temple draws devotees who go there for the love of God. And on the other hand, Mother Teresa's home, it draws people uh, who have love for fellow human beings who want to come and heal them. And um, if you look at the volunteers there, for example, there's so many of them who are international volunteers. You'll hardly find any Indian, you know, in, I don't know how your experience was. Um, there are very few Indian volunteers there. Um, it's sparse. They're, they're, they're f the numbers of people who, who are um, homeless and who need the, you know, the, the facilities provided by, the, by Mother Teresa's home is far outnumbers the, the people who are actually there to help. And it's just the opposite if you look at the temple. The people queuing up. People queuing up and you know, there's no place to even um, you know, actually um, go out and buy, I don't know, whatever the, uh, the flowers and a couple of things that, that, that they use to offer the temple. And the, it's so contrasting. Anybody go in with an open mind. It's hard. It's so hard not to um, feel, you know, feel disheartened. Um, at this point, I do feel disheartened that if that kind of devotion and love that one has irreverent this kind of love that you have for a for God for you know for a idol. If we can if we can have at least some of that for and the kind of unconditional uh, you know love that you have towards our own fellow human beings. Um, and my whole chapter on love is for that. So a lot of people who pick up the book is like love would be about romantic love, but you know human. I mean love between humans is probably uh, something that we really need to think about and, and do about. Yeah, well, um, what about your whole concept about the lack of love in general in the society? Have you experienced that? Do you, would you say that people do care? Uh, 
doesn't have. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story that I had. Uh, when I first came back from the US, I was at the Hindu pharmacy. And I came out with, I think, the change of 20 rupees in my hand. And as I came out, I saw this, this woman who's quote unquote called in Goa, the, the migrant, the outsider, sitting over there, absolutely skinny as a, as a reed, suckling a baby to an absolutely dried up breast. So my, my sense of, of caring just came out and I gave her the 20 rupees that I had in my hand, which I did, and that brought about the reaction that I could, could not quite understand. There was a man there, a Goan, who started screaming at me and telling me that people like you are destroying our, our Goa, destroying our society, all because I gave her 20 rupees. These people should not even be here. Now, that to me represented a complete lack of love. And it so happened, so happened, because his wife was in a dress, I assumed that he was a Catholic. And being a Catholic myself, that is not what <laughs> I believe Jesus taught us. So that came across as a big shock, the total lack of indifference, empathy, to the point of anger, you know, that we should just take this woman with her baby and throw her out of the state. Um, and that, that, that is what I felt in, 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 in Go when I first arrived. Have you had similar experiences? Um, yeah, several. I mean, you know, I think these are the kind of experiences which uh, drove me to write the book. Um, and you know, when you talk of, so exactly Patricia, I'm so glad you picked up this example because when you talk of equality, honestly, if you're, if you're a bunch of economists and you're talking of equality, this is not the, what you would be talking about. You'd be talking about numbers and probably things are, you know, becoming brighter. But this is what we have to be talking about. The book is about how do these big notions of equality, love, nationalism, democracy, how does that actually translate into our personal lives and to our interpersonal lives? I've come across so many of these examples um, and it's, it really bothers me, it br brings me to tears each time. Um, I think um, there is this big, you know, there's, we're very concerned about dirt in, in India, and I've written about that in the values chapter. Um, that some, you know, dirt is actually just some particles displaced, right? Like what is dirt? It's just, it, it was outside and it's just come here. And that is, it, it, that notion actually, com it translates into most things that we do. That why is this girl with the baby, why is she here? She should be elsewhere. You know, because she's dirt, she's dirty. Yes. And the day that we overcome this, um, you know, negative approach towards dirt, that there's nothing that's dirty. The sand on the beach you play and the sand which, you know, mixed with some, the soil over here is great for your farms. If it's at home, it's all right. You know, if you go even for some of my travels that I did, uh, for example, in the temples, um, you know, it's, a, it's the richest temple um, of, of India and there the tonsure, so when you shave off the head, it's considered very dirty. So, you know, anything which is coming out, any bodily, um, you know, parts and these, all considered very dirty. The, if you look at architecture, um, traditionally in our houses, the bathrooms are supposed, the toilets are supposed to be outside the house. Why? Because it's dirty, there's any you know, excretions coming out of the house. And that Translate. So once I think we, if we if we come over, get over the concept of dirt, that it's all right. There's nothing really that's dirty. Mm -hmm. We'll I think we'll we'll really be better people for that. We'll be able to love things which are displaced. Okay. Uh, any questions from the audience? Because we have about ten minutes left. Please. Uncharted roads, 
from uh, from people. The kindness is what has stayed in the head and allowed us to go this far uh, into strange lands. But there's always been that element of kindness which has been the legacy. So there is love, and uh, the only thing I think we get stuck in and juxtapose with is this dirt element which you talked of, very well spoken, I think, that displacement or expression, both these things polarize and therefore you lose sight and are not able to express perhaps that love in the way most people would like to. For example, uh, what you spoke about, the education and the marriage and etc. These are two or three of the biggest decisions that people take in life. And yet there is no rational thought or authenticity when most people in India and even abroad, I would say to some extent, take it. So if these three things are taken care of, uh, or uh, what shall I say, not the focus of the discussion, then there is a lot of love. I mean, the, I cannot explain the kind of kindness and love that we have seen in 20 years, just traveling by road by strangers. It's just when we bracket, no, what you said, we bracket it and we think it's a displacement, etc. That's the play. Now, a stranger, just, I mean, I cannot explain. I, it's really such a wonderful legacy of love. So when you are saying that, I understand it totally. But that's the what you said. The context and the settings determine yeah. how we react. It, it is. It is that. So uh, it depends on who you are. So if you, you know, if, so I think you know. The caste system is dismantled. A little bit of the identity is, is there. Uh, but it really depends on the context. So for example, um, sometimes gender matters, sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes which part of the country you belong to matters, sometimes it doesn't. So it, it's a mix of your identity and who you are and the context that you in, are in, which determines how much love you would get. Optimism has always been part of uh, yeah. one's life. Very yes, important. yes, yes. You suggested that they should, uh, they have their own kind of education system and that should be developed. For me, the problem is this. The education in India, the, the power lies with the English language. And this kind of suggestion is often spoken about for the poor, the desire disadvantage the you know uh, marginalized people won't they remain in their margins if they don't get the same kind of english education that the people in power have yeah um the um the development, which, and education is part of the development, you know, of uh, Adivasi community. Somehow, um, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm agreeing that they need to be developed because that, for me, is the bigger question. But then, let's say, assume that you know there are a group of people who people feel that to Cape tribals need to be developed. Then, um, that wish for development doesn't always come from them. It is usually either the government. 
Um, it is uh, missionary organizations. Um, and then it is groups within them itself. So you can call you know, the certain um, Maoists or whatever, you know, they are, they are called by, by us, but then there are essentially groups within them itself who say that, who think that you know, they need to be uh, developed. And the police plays a very important role as well in, on the ground in enforcing this. Um, so the, my, my take on this is that, is it their choice? It's, it's not coming from them, number one. The second is that when you talk of education, and let's say, that, you know, in case education is an important part of development and stuff, and if we are going, then the primary role of education should be to have a person know about the choices available and to be able to make a choice that is best suited to that person. And then that's another, completely another different thing that is the person in a situation where, where the person can actually implement that choice or not. And which is going to be, which is very difficult, you know, for uh, people in the, the tribal communities. The person who's uneducated. Yeah. yeah. So, um, in that context, I think what you said, that to be able to, to be able to know the choices. He's wondering why is Mama not with him. <laughs> so um, to be able to know the choices, I think that's where yes, English language or you know whatever the language is, maybe the local language is important. Uh, but we should be very clear that it's not just English. It is also uh, education should be aimed at um, not literacy. Literacy is not education. It should be aimed at getting them to understand what choices they need to make because otherwise you know you teach them ABCD and in English language but at the say at the other end you know you're you know they, they then just go and vote for who they are being forced to vote to that is not at you know the uh, that yeah that's not the result of education. I think we'll have to stop here because I see we the people waving out to me please give a hand to mm -hmm. Manima. Nanai, and, 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 and do buy her book because it's, it's simply fascinating. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Appreciate it.